Welcome to Cyberside Chats from Epic, a global legal services provider. Hosted by Jarek Beeson, Chief Information Security Officer at Epic, Cyberside Chats is where professionals come to hear CISO and industry leader insights on the latest news and trends for cybersecurity and privacy in the legal industry. Welcome to Epic Cyberside Chat, where we are excited to be developing content for and by the legal and privacy industries. Now, there's a lot of cybersecurity content in media, but we believe there's a gap when it comes to the legal industry, and we're using this show to address that very thing. My name is Jarek Beeson, and I'm a Senior Vice President and the Chief Information Security Officer over at Epic, and I'll be your host. You know, we've been doing this for a little over half a year now, and we really want to hear from you guys. Is this content helpful? Do you want more from us? Do you want us to go deeper on any specific topics? You know, we try to keep the conversation at a high level, you know, so anyone can understand, but we want to know if we're, if we're really hitting the mark. So please feel free to reach out, you leave a comment, subscribe if you're if you're interested. We just want to know that, you know, what we're developing is actually uh, serving the purpose. Well, now that we got that out of the way, we have a very interesting subject, one that I don't think many people have even heard about, and I really have heard no one ever talk about it publicly, at least not on any form of podcast or YouTube show or anything along those lines. And we're going to talk about escrowing software. And people may not be familiar with it, and that's exactly why we're doing it. And we have an attorney who is quickly becoming the go-to attorney for corporations with complex legal issues where software escrow may be uh, the solution. His name is Don Dennis, and he focuses on intellectual property, infringement matters, technology transactions, data security and privacy law, and most recently, software escrow. He attained his Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering from Northwestern and his Juris Doctor from UCLA. Don, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. So make sure I make sure I get this right. Do you prefer Don or Donald? My name is Don, so I got to stick with that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. So let me make sure I didn't truncate your name without your permission. So is there anything else you want to share uh, with our listeners about yourself? Sure. And I appreciate the intro. It's a pleasure to be here. As Jarek stated, I did obtain my bachelor's degree in engineering, but I'm a little bit different than a lot of attorneys because I worked in various aspects of engineering from dealing with working for the federal government and working in private industry and dealing with GPS projects and software projects. And I did this for about 10 years before attending law school. So my office offers a unique perspective in terms of engineering matters, having worked as an engineer for such an extensive period of time. And My office focuses on pretty much four succinct areas. We handle regulatory compliance in which we're looking at preparing corporate policies and training staff, cyber insurance review, data breach incident management, where we actually analyze structured and unstructured data that may be a part of a breach or data incident handle the notifications and public relations, litigation related to intellectual property, audits and investigation, and most importantly for our topic today, technology transactions in which we are constantly negotiating with SaaS, software as a service vendors with a goal of protecting our clients. Because oftentimes you are presented with a boilerplate agreement, but as we know, the key word in boilerplate is boil and every company's level at which something will raise their ire or they will boil or something will be uncomfortable is different. So that's why those terms don't work the same for every specific company. All right. You got me and my blood boiling and I'm I'm ready to get rocking and rolling. So for those that aren't familiar with our show, hopefully a lot of you listeners are, but if not, we start all of our shows with a link and an article. And the article is directly related to the topic at hand. And this one comes from JD Supra. And if you're not familiar with JD Supra, they bring together a lot of content and information from various legal and law sources. And this one was actually penned by Lowenstein Sandler LLP. And it's titled Source Code Escrow Agreements Are Reaching for the Cloud. As always, the link uh, to the article is in the show notes for anyone that to read it for themselves. So when I read this article, it's pretty clear that the business of escrowing software has been around for a while. But now we're starting to see a transformation in that it's moving to the cloud because that's where software is going. 
So, Don, given that software escrow isn't a mainstream topic, how about you just give us a your definition? What exactly is software escrow management and why should more companies look into it? Thank you. First off, SaaS, software as a service, is pretty much the way all software is being built or the majority of software is built these days. And it involves a software application that's built in the cloud and you use it, your company uses it, you host your data there and they have their own production environment which is outside of your premises. Years ago, individuals and companies would purchase software and install the disk directly to your computer, upload the key code and you're moving forward. Now you are relying on a third party that you've never met, most likely never seen. They could walk right by you in person and you wouldn't even know it. And you have to think, and the reason this is so important is because imagine you operating your own business. However, you don't have all the infrastructure or capabilities to operate it. So you find someone else that has that factory or facility that you need, you take all of your confidential information, your business trade secrets, your data, and you put it in their office or their factory and you go and work there every day and you leave your information out on a table because they've assured you everything is safe, nothing, no one will interfere with your work and you are good to go. So you have valuable information there. What would happen if that company's office burnt down if someone broke in that company's office, or if the company just went out of business. That is the risk that you take when you're using SaaS applications. It's the same idea. So software escrow management is a risk management strategy that's used to create an identical environment that an escrow management company will maintain for you and it will release it to you upon a condition. So this escrow company will copy that software application, all of your data that is stored in that application to a second server located in a secure area and possibly even host a standby production environment and provide you access to that company's software upon certain conditions. So it's kind of like for computer programmers, and if then logic, if this happens, then that is supposed to happen. So if then the most basic thing that companies are looking for is if this software vendor can no longer provide me the software that I need to function and for my business to operate effectively, then automatically the escrow management company will step in, release the software and allow me to work using my same software to maintain business continuity for a certain period of time. And oftentimes those periods may be around 90 days so that you can migrate to a new provider. So the goal is for your company to maintain continuity and resilience against the unexpected. That is an amazing analogy. The the visual that you portrayed in that I go into a specific office that's not managed by myself and I do all of my business there. And, you know, I'll, I'll take it even even more personal. You know, I take all of my clothes there. I bring, you know, my, my cell phone there, my cell phone chargers there. Everybody knows how important the cell phone charger is. Right. And then all of a sudden that company goes out of business and all of that stuff that I put in there it's just gone. And then more so than that, I chose that company for a reason. So I chose that specific building because of what that building offered to me. And if I were to translate that into software, I have core business processes that are heavily dependent upon what that software is providing. I've either built my business processes around that software or the software was designed around my business processes. Either way, I am dependent upon them. And I can think of things like logistics or ERP and some of the things that are really core to every business. If if those businesses, those companies were go out of business, let's just say, God forbid, Salesforce just closed the doors and, and went out of business, a lot of people would be in dire straits at that point in time. Now, I don't think that's possible. This is more so for your, your up and comers, your Series A, Series B, Series C companies, and maybe the mom and pop shops that, that may not be able to make it. But this is definitely a topic that I think we need to dig in a little bit deeper. So, <clears throat> Jared, can I just interject something? Please. You were making a lot of valid points and everything that you were talking about 
falls under, in my opinion, why companies should look into this idea. You talked about going out of business. Another key thing is what about if they could no longer provide those critical services? Because as you know, being in the IT field, oftentimes companies may choose to no longer support a certain platform. And they don't necessarily always run a survey to see who is most dependent on that platform. Another thing that you mentioned, although you mentioned Salesforce not likely going out of business, which we don't wish upon anyone. However, we know that even the federal government has been subject to a data breach, different departments. And so many companies are subject to data breaches and we hear about it all the time. And since this podcast is desiring to focus on privacy, I thought that that was a very important topic because if you are relying on a third party SaaS provider, software provider, and they experience a data breach, such as if you were working out of someone else's factory and someone breaks in, how comfortable are you going to be to continue to leave your valuable proprietary secrets, information, and other data lying around knowing that they may have experienced a security problem? Maybe they have a data breach and their system goes down. What are you supposed to do in the meantime where they're not paying off the hacker? What if there is an exfiltration and certain data has been taken from that place that you that was used and maybe it, you don't know if it includes your data or not? Are you still going to trust to leave your confidential information there in a physical location, as the example I gave, or in the cloud to someone where you're not so certain of their security protocol. So let's let's double click on that one. You're you're positioning a scenario in which I had not considered. So I've consistently considered the scenario in which the company that once had funding no longer has funding, they close their doors and you never hear from them again. I have not considered the scenario where the company that I'm dependent upon has a data breach. I no longer want to do business with them, but there really is no peer that I can move to. There is no competitor necessarily that I can move to. So I want to still continue to do business the same way, but just maybe not under the guise of that business. So I'm going to want their software code so I can effectively run it myself and instead of having to trust them to run it. Is that the scenario you're referring to? Well, partially. I'm referring, you're exactly correct in which you are losing confidence in that vendor. However, it also falls down to a business decision as to whether or not the risk reward ratio, how it falls out. For example, you were saying maybe they don't have a peer. However, the implications of being caught in that scenario based on what intervention or what actions may be taken by various governmental authorities may persuade you to go to multiple peers if it would take multiple peers to provide the same functionality that one peer was providing. So for example, if you use, as you were saying, Salesforce, or if you use Box or DocuSign to accomplish multiple tasks, you might be so shaken to the core based on what has happened and the potential for assessments, fines, and other actions by attorney general's offices that you'll say it's in our company's best interest to move away from this vendor and to migrate in a fashion that is calculated so that I can reduce my risk. Because just because the vendor, for example, suffered a data breach, it does not mean the attorney general's office is not going to pursue action or contact you for comment. Because at the end of the day, any data that your company has was given to you and you chose who you would share that data with or entrust it to. Understood. And so would you use the software escrow capability as a stopgap while you find a new uh, provider to move over to? Or it, is it the new end all be all? No, no, no. You, that's exactly right. It can work as a stopgap and allow you time to migrate to a new vendor. And that's exactly the purpose of it. So now let me put my myself in the shoes of the provider. Someone's coming to me asking me for a software escrow management. I liken it to, you know, asking for a prenup before you get married to somebody. In, in many cases, people may consider that, you know, you're looking for a backdoor out. You're looking to make this beneficial as you leave. That's not necessarily the partnership that I want to engage in. How would you respond to that? From a vendor's standpoint, 
I believe that now more than ever, vendors are understanding, as I was saying in my example, the amount of trust, the amount of confidence that people are placing in them. And you can, in negotiating the agreement between the vendor and the licensee, you're not telling the vendor, hey, I want all of your proprietary software code and documents and hardware that's necessary to run the production environment to enable the software just to have it. I only want it upon specified release conditions. And those conditions are typically acceptable. And I'm going to tell you why. And we'll get into it later. But some of the conditions deal with if the vendor is, in fact, going out of business, if the vendor is having problems updating the software. So these are not things. So the goal is not per se that I don't trust the vendor. The goal is that life and business life, to be more specific, is uncertain. Also, all businesses, just like everything else, go through various life cycles. So there could be a potential of something to happen and the vendor wants to best be positioned. Also, it's to the vendor's advantage because it diminishes it helps them manage reputational harm in the event that they have something because the same way that most companies and almost all companies purchase commercial insurance or cyber insurance is just more so an insurance policy. You don't want to have to use your insurance policy, but you can't purchase insurance after your house is burned down. I think that is the perfect end to this segment. You're, you're right. It's an insurance policy. And if the vendor is confident that the various scenarios or triggers to call for software escrow services to take over, if they're confident they're not going to experience those, then then why wouldn't they agree to it? Makes makes sense to me. All right. Well, let's move on to our next round, the Ask the CISO round. What do you got for me? So I wanted to know, since we're focusing, the podcast focuses on privacy and IT issues. What is your thought process when you're conducting a security risk analysis of a potential SaaS company to engage in business with? So outside of kind of what you just discussed and, you know, is the company, is, is, are they healthy, right? Are they, are they going to be around? And from a security perspective, I look at a few different things, starting with third-party attestations. You know, what's available for me to review? Do you have a SOC 2? Is it a type 1 or a type 2? I'm going to want to look at that. I'm going to look at that report thoroughly. Do you have ISO certification, HIPAA, SOCs? There are so many different certifications based off of, you know, industry or region or jurisdiction or country. And I just want to know, have you aligned with those? And then I'm going to look at things like penetration tests. Have you had your penetration test? And what are the results? How have you responded? How have you addressed the findings? And I'm going to look at all these documents and all of these uh, cert certificates just to ensure you have the basic controls from protect, detect, respond, and recover capabilities, the fundamentals, if you will. And then I'm going to look and see, are you aligning with the various compliance and privacy requirements? You know, ITAR, GDPR, you know, a lot of those apply to me. And as part of my compliance, I have to ensure that the flow down to my SaaS providers includes those same those same controls. And I don't want to lose compliance because the SaaS provider I've selected isn't compliant. And, and then I want to know things like where is the data stored? You know, partially because of compliance, but also because there are just certain regions where restrictions are imposed on what they can do from a security perspective. China is a good example of that when it comes to encryption, as an example. And then I want to have some level of comfort that the compromise of that provider won't result in my compromise. And there really is no exact science in, in how you do that, but I want to know that it's something that they're thinking about. And then I'm going to look at things like availability, resiliency. You know, do you have the denial of service protection? Ultimately, I need to know that the service will be available when I need it. And then there's just some very basic controls, things like, you know, data encryption at transit and rest. I want to know if they're offering capabilities like two-factor authentication. If my password is the only front door, you know, only way to get into the front door and there is no other way to authenticate, that's a big red flag for me because passwords are a really weak way of accessing any system at this point. And every company that really cares about security is offering two-factor. And then contractually, I look at reporting timeframes. You know, what can you assure me when it comes to if something occurs in your environment how soon are you going to let me know? 
And I'm pretty sure there are more things, but off the top of my head, those are some of the things that come off the top of my head. Well, the thing is, I'm familiar with every single thing that you talked about. And for listeners that may be unfamiliar, the fact that you summarized it, each almost each of those terms can you can write a paragraph or a page about it to really go into detail. And those are often things that I have to negotiate because your what one party's definition of a reporting time frame is or what a breach is or what an issue is can vastly differ from another party's definition. And so it is very important having been with companies that were in the trenches in the midst of data breaches or data incidents because they each have different legal definitions makes a big difference because they may a company could say hey we've just had a data incident and it is not a breach whereas from our standpoint it is a breach and it's turned into a notifiable event so all of those things that you said are extremely important especially in light of you mentioned numerous legal policies such as GDPR and CCPA and there are time frames in which you have to report so if we're not we don't have a clear definition of certain things that's a problem or it can be a problem so I, everything you said resonates heavily with me yeah i agree and there is definitely some ambiguity around what a what a data breach is so if you were to ask the public, you know, most most people would most likely say uh, a hacker gets in, accesses data and maybe exfiltrates data. But then if you ask, you know, certain lawyers, they may say if data ends up in the hands of someone that it shouldn't end up in, that's a breach, no matter how it happens, whether it be, you know, via text message, accidentally, maliciously and, and so forth. So it is really imperative that you get those breach definitions defined. And what, I, what I'm hearing from some of my friends that work in three-letter agencies is there is actually legislation in the process of being developed for a national breach reporting type of law. And we've talked about this for a long time. There are, they exist, as you, as you alluded to, in certain privacy regulations, but we can't get to an agreeable definition of what a breach is. So, what do you think? You know, just your opinion, not that it's right or wrong. I just really want to hear from, you know, different lawyers perspectives. What exactly is a data breach? Well, in my opinion, the way that I try to explain it to clients is there's three different scenarios. There's first an event and I'm doing this just so that we're clear. So there's first an event where someone attempts to obtain data from your system. Let's say they try to log in and they're unsuccessful. That would qualify as a data event. An incident, a data incident, is where you're uncertain about whether there has been an authorized acquisition or access has occurred to data. However, there's a greater likelihood that data has left or will leave. Oftentimes, the things that you hear about in the news would fall into this category of a data incident until the findings and the forensic reports and all of that has been completed. An actual data breach is exactly, as you said, a legal definition that pretty much differs in every single state in the United States. Also, it's different in the European Union. And what in general, what I would say is in the United States, we would classify a data breach and as a situation where we know that there has been unauthorized access or acquisition of sensitive information and a possibility that an individual may be harmed. Each word that I just gave, unfortunately, has another definition. So <laughs> sensitive information depends from state to state. In some states, the, their name plus your date of birth is sensitive personal, is personal identifiable information that triggers a data breach and a notification. In other states, just the date of birth does not. So it all depends. But what's uniform in mostly all of the states is your name plus your social security number is in fact a notifiable event and a data breach. So those would be the three definitions. I just try to break it down between an event, an incident, and an actual breach. It, th thank you for that. And also thank you for further explaining why it's so difficult 
so many people are wondering, shouting from the rooftop, why aren't more companies reporting these incidents, these breaches, these attacks? And why isn't the government doing something about it? And the government is trying, but as you as you point out so aptly, every state defines sensitive data differently. And I don't know that it's as simple as giving breach requirements until we give requirements for the data types. And sensitive data, that's not necessarily data that could result in harm, right? There is data that could result in harm that's not sensitive. So let's use the Colonial Pipeline as an example, right? If they got schematics, if they got information that could result in some type of physical harm being done, it doesn't align with PII. It doesn't align with sensitive data. It doesn't align with top secret data. It doesn't align with all of the those other data types that are out there. But many would argue that's pretty sensitive information, right? So it just kind of just shines a light on how big of a challenge we have, why things are, are moving so slow. And it's going to take a concerted effort and collaboration across virtually every industry, every municipality, every state, and, and the federal government to come to something that we all agree upon. And it's probably going to be a massive document. It's going to take a long time for people to really interpret it. And we, we may be years out even after the, the law comes out before we start to see it truly in effect. And then the next one is, all right, so we've come up with this law. How do we actually enforce it? Right. We We hear about all of the ransomware that was publicly impacting. We don't know about all the other ransomware cases where the company just hurried up and paid, made it go away, and and all as well. So it's it's going to be interesting to see what, what comes of all of this. Yeah, with respect to the very last point that you mentioned, the, we do not have all the time real-time results of different data incidents and breaches that occur. However, sometimes we can get information from the FBI through IC3, Internet Crimes, Internet Computer Crime Center, and so therefore they, you know, have information they can share and they give out statistics. For example, they talked about how during COVID, the number of scams and COVID-related scams had drastically increased with people trying to sell products and people trying to do all types of things, and especially with the PPP stuff. So, you know, there are a few resources out there, but obviously we don't have everything because not everything is reported. And often, oftentimes things are not reported because people don't want to have increase their loss history for their insurance policies in terms of companies. So I agree, it is very hard to get a firm grasp on the information and the level of activity that is, you know, done each year. I agree, I agree. I think this is a good place to close out our conversation. I end out every show with a very simple question that aligns with the expertise of our of our guest. And given that you are uh, the person we brought on to talk specifically about software escrow, what would you recommend to any organization, either vendor or potential acquirer of vendor to, to do if they want to pursue or see if software escrow makes sense for, for their organization? All right. So first off, you want to look at a few key areas, release conditions, the deposit and the verification of the software and the escrow license effective date. So with respect to release conditions, you have to clearly define under what conditions you as the licensee or beneficiary or company that is using the software will actually be able to access that software. You, They have certain times you can negotiate conditions if, based on the level that you're paying for on an annual agreement or certain standard, they, have, do, they do have standard templates where they're non-negotiable, but they offer that service, software escrow management, for a cheaper price. But assuming that you are going to be negotiating, you want to know what constitutes a material breach of that agreement in terms of how long it has to go on before being cured, and then you would have access to the software. You would want to know maybe a possible release condition to put in there is if the vendor you're using is acquired by your competitor. You wouldn't want your competitor to have access to your information and be in control of how your business operates on a frequent or daily basis. With respect to deposit and verification, it's easy to say, hey, the vendor is going to obtain the source code, but also you want to make sure that the escrow company gets a copy of, I'm sorry, you want to make sure the vendor 
gives the right source code to the escrow company, but you also want to make sure the escrow company has the build instructions, the name and contact information for each author, the creator of the software, and as Jarek said earlier, the encryption tools and keys so you can access it. Also, you want to make sure that it's put in your agreement that after the release, any updates, upgrades, patches, bug fixes, new versions, that that software that's being held with the escrow management company is updated and that you also have all the documents necessary to enable someone else to read the software, compile it, and allow it to be executed. In addition, you want to think carefully, how often will you verify the software? Yes, after you sign this agreement, the escrow company has it, but have you validated it? Have you performed a file integrity test to ensure all the files are there? Have you checked it to make sure they actually are working? Sometimes called a usability test. This is very important because you would hate to get to the scenario where you have triggered a proper release condition and you open up the file and it is unmanageable and cannot be used. In addition, although there are negotiated release conditions that your company and the vendor agree to, what will happen in the event of a dispute where the vendor is saying, hey, do not release my software and my code to this beneficiary or licensee company because I don't agree that a release condition has occurred. How will that be handled? Because if this allows to go, if this is allowed to go on too long based on the vendor's challenge, the usefulness of the code will disappear. So you may want to properly consider including an expedited arbitration provision in this agreement. Also, it's important to have the escrow license that you're granted, that the, that the vendor grants to the escrow company be effective immediately. Even though you as the customer don't have access to the code and you may never get it if a triggering event occurs, you want that license to become effective immediately. Because if that license is only effective upon a release condition and the vendor goes into bankruptcy, the license can be rescinded in bankruptcy and now you're out of the license. So that is extremely important. And those are some of the key points, along with many others that I highly recommend companies consider when crafting these agreements. And again, just in general terms, I agree with what Jarek said in terms of putting together the proper due diligence. He listed all of the different things that are important with due diligence. But as a business decision, because attorneys, we're trained to talk about what the law is. But the key question before we get into all of this is, is this technology the proper candidate for escrow management? What is the financial investment that you're making in this? How crucial is this technology to your company? How much time have you spent training users in the technology? What is your ability to replace it? Such as Jarek was saying earlier in terms of the migration. So you want to think about all of that before you go down the path to pursue a software escrow management agreement. Wow. So first of all, I, I brought you on thinking I could hold my own in this topic. I, I know a little bit about this. You have proven me otherwise. You've given me a lot to think about. And what I'm really hearing in a really resounding way is don't do this alone. <laughs> seek out guidance, seek out an expert that has done this, that has been there because it's not as simple as just go and get an escrow management service and, you know, cross your fingers, hope it all works out. There, there are a lot of pieces to this. And if you are heavily dependent upon a software vendor to perform a certain part of your business, you really need to heavily think about this. If you already have, you know, legal support or you already have outside uh, counsel, you should definitely make this a topic uh, that you bring up with them. And if you are outside counsel, you should get up on this topic. Software is eating the world. I think that is a phrase that came out a while ago. And I would posit to say software as a service is eating software. So thank you again, Don, for, for being on our show. This was a abundance of information and, and a, a deluge of knowledge that just came my way and hopefully to our listeners as well. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions or ideas from today's show, share them with us by emailing cyberside at epicglobal.com. Don't forget to follow us on socials. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram by searching for Epic Global. Until next time, stay cyber smart. <music>